and online. It's good to be with you this weekend. Last weekend, I know many of you were gone uh, because of the weather, and I was gone as well. I took uh, time to have my, my cataract fixed, and uh, then I spent some time with some girlfriends at a wedding, and then took a planning time to be together with uh, just God and plan and pray for you all, pray for our church, and see how we can go forward in 2022 and where God is calling us to serve and give. Well, the next four weeks... Uh, we are going to be in a series called Committed, hashtag Committed. Now, probably there's no reason to explain to you what Committed means, but you may not understand what hashtag means. The hashtag was started by Twitter in 2007. It's a, for lack of a better word, it's a way to catalog information. If you're on social media, you can put a hashtag in front of a word and it will connect you to anyone else who has also tagged a post with that word. We've used it on Instagram, Facebook, um, our, our social media platforms with hashtag say yes, hashtag first church Sedalia, hashtag VBS, and lots of different ways. So it not only tells people you're talking about it, you can find what they're talking about. And it's a way to say that you're a part of a bigger group of people and what you're talking and thinking about. So right now people are talking about committed to different um, New Year's resolutions are committed to playing for colleges or um, universities, lots of different things. And one of the things that we're committed to at First Church is our motto, which is leading people to an active faith in Jesus Christ. Now that won't stop after the New Year's resolutions start wearing off in that first or second weekend of February. We are continuing to be committed to leading people to an active faith and learning them more about what that journey looks like in individual lives. And so in this month, we are, com- we are focusing on a memory verse of Proverbs 16, 3, to commit to the Lord whatever you do, and God will establish your plans. So at First Church, we are looking towards a new year to see where God is calling us. And this morning, we're going to start out with a focus on committed And I would ask you to join your hearts with mine as we seek God's face in this message today. Lord God, we are thankful people for how you give and you mold us and you make us to look like you. And and as we give our hearts to you and surrender our ways to you. So Lord, help us to see your hand working in our lives. And Lord, this morning, would you speak through me? In your strong name we pray. Amen. In these next few weeks, we're going to see what it looks like to be committed with our time, our talents, our resources, what it looks like in our own lives, what it looks like in the church life. But the first thing we're going to look at today is the presence. Now, this is not presence like Christmas, but presence, like being in place with someone. We're going to talk about this week uh, um, Jacob. We find Jacob's story in the Old Testament. He's one of the patriarchs. He was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. God gave Isaac, or excuse me, gave Jacob the name Israel. And Jacob also had another name, um, or his name meant something. When he was born, he was named Jacob because he was grabbing onto the heel of his brother. And supplanter, it means that it's an um, idiom for takes advantage of or a deceiver. That's Jacob's name. So we're going to look at his story, part of it, which starts in Genesis 28, and we're going to read these passages together. It starts in verse 10. It said that Jacob left Beersheba, and he set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, and taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head to lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven, And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And the Lord said, I am the Lord your God of your father Abraham and of the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. I'm with you, and I'll watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And when Jacob woke up from this dream, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was 
not aware of it. Now, if we didn't read anything more of Jacob's story, we could be encouraged because God has promised to be with him. God is faithful, and we know that God, that these promises that God has made to Jacob, that they apply to our lives too. But I want us to back up a little bit more in Jacob's story and see how he got to this place. So you ever watch those movies where you start watching, then it says like seven years before. So we're going to go back three chapters to Genesis 25. And this is when Isaac and Rebecca are expecting Jacob. And Rebecca asks God, hey, why is there so much jostling within me? And God says, there are two nations in you. And God says, you're going to have two babies. And they have two babies, Jacob and Esau. And Esau is born red and hairy. And they name him Esau. And Jacob is born grabbing hold of Esau's heel. And, and that's why he has the name Jacob. And so they grew up, and it says that Esau became a skillful hunter, and Jacob stayed closer to home. And Isaac loved Esau, the father loved Esau, and Rebekah, the mother, loved Jacob. So the story goes on, and Jacob is uh, mixing, making stew one day, and Esau comes in from being out and about in the lands, and he says to Jacob, I'm famished. Give me some of that stew. And Jacob says, you know what, you give me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. Now the birthright was the, what gave that son the right to make decisions on the family's behalf. It also meant a double inheritance. So Esau, who says he is famished, says, you know what, I'm going to die and my birthright's not going to be any good to me unless I eat. So give me the stew and you can have my birthright. And it says that Esau despised his birthright after that. So going forward a few more chapters, we come to Genesis 27 to see that Jacob, Isaac's father, uh, Jacob's father Isaac is nearing the end of his life. It says Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see and he called for Esau. He says, Esau, come in here. He said, Esau, I need you to go hunting, find the choice game, make me some stew and then come back and I'm going to give you a blessing. So Esau leaves, but in the margins, on the side of the perimeter, Rebecca, the mother, is listening. And she calls Jacob. Jacob. She says, Jacob, come here. Your father is going to give Esau the blessing, but I think you should go in and get the blessing from your father, for he's old and he can't see. And Jacob's like, I don't look anything like my brother. My brother's all hairy. She says, you don't worry about it. I'll take care of this. So she says, you go out and get a couple of goats, and I'll fix the food. So Jacob goes out, gets some goats. They make this meal that's Isaac's favorite, and she takes the goat hair and puts it on Jacob's body so that he feels hairy. But this is when we have to remember that verse that says Isaac's eyes were very weak because obviously that wouldn't seem like a pretty very good description or a, uh, you know, a way to trick his father, but his mother gives him his clothes, he goes in, so he's dressed like Esau, has hair on his body. He goes in and says, Father, I'm here. And Isaac says, who is it? And Jacob says, it's me, Esau. And he says, well, come closer so I can feel you. And he says, well, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. And Jacob says, no, it's me, it's me. And so Esau says, are you really my son Esau? Yes, it's me. So Isaac gives this blessing to his son, the younger son. And then he leaves, and in walks Esau. And Esau's got the stew all ready for his father, ready to take the blessing. And the father says, who are you? And Esau's like, I'm here. I, Esau, I'm here for the blessing. He says, I just gave your blessing to somebody else. Now, it wasn't just so easy just to say something and say something different. It would be like signing a contract and say, I just signed a contract with somebody else. That word was binding. And so all of a sudden, Esau realizes he's been tricked. Isaac, the father, realizes he's been tricked. And they're furious. And he said, your brother has deceitfully taken your blessing. And it says that Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to him. And he said, the days of my mourning for my father are near. As soon as that's done, I will kill my brother Jacob. Well, Rebecca was told, was told that her, brother, her son Esau had said, and she sent for Jacob and says, your brother is planning to avenge himself by killing you. 
So I need you to flee. Go to my brother's house, um, Laban in Haran, and stay there until his fury subsides. And when your brother's no longer angry with you, um, he'll forget about it, and he'll, and then I'll send for you to come back, because why should I leave two boys in one day? So boys will be boys, right? They tussle and they fight. How many of you have boys? Or how many of you have been a boy with a brother, all right? So you know how boys wrestle around with each other. Now, my boys are ages 15 to 21, and there are four of them. So I brought some pictures of them a re- that I took recently. And maybe those aren't recent pictures, but as their mama, that's how I still see them, right? You all get that. It's another picture of them protecting their sister on the tractor and these two little boys running through the field. It's been a long time since they looked like that, but here's what they really look like. They went to the Chiefs game in December. Carlton and Brian, Camden, Coleman, and Chapman. They're actually in birth order in that picture. I hadn't noticed that. So actually birth order. But you know what? I don't, I grew up with a sister. I grew up with lots of female cousins. I grew up with lots of aunts. I didn't understand boys. I have four boys. I don't always understand boys. How is it that they can be happy We're all just chatting and carrying on and everything is going well and then someone throws a punch. I don't get it. Then they're wrestling on the floor. I don't even understand what happened in that moment for everything to change. So I called a member of our church this week. I missed the phone call. She called me back. I missed the phone call. And then she called me back again and she said, sorry, I couldn't talk earlier. My boys were home from after school and I was breaking up fisticuffs between them. I said, I am so thankful that I, it's like this affirmation that this is what boys do. They just wrestle, and they're always at each other, but they seem to still be smiling at the end of it all. Because boys will be boys. But this situation between Jacob and Esau was not a typical boys will be boys. There was more to it than that. Jacob had been deceitful in in a huge way. And Esau recognizes the deceitfulness and says, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. And if we kept going on to Genesis 32, we would read, when Jacob's going to come face to face with Esau, it says he had fear and distress when he knew he would be seeing his brother again because all of the dishonesty that had taken place. But God is still working through Jacob, calling him to something new and different. So this question always remains, what's this have to do with me? What does this have to do with our lives today? So now we're back to Genesis 28, now that we have this backstory. Jacob had left Beersheba and headed for Haran. We know now why. He was on the run. He was scared for his life because of his poor choices and his circumstances. And how many of us have been on the run before? Maybe not running for our lives. Maybe we've left because of a job, or we've left our homes, or we've left a relationship out of fear or concern, regret because of our own actions or the actions of someone else. And when we get going and we're on the run what is the one feeling that we feel consistently with everyone else we feel alone and when we feel that time of alone there's a lot of conversation that's taking place but it's typically not with anyone but me myself and I I have a friend who says that we fill fill in the silence with our own thoughts And we're thinking what that other person must be thinking about us, but they're typically not thoughts that are affirming. So Jacob's fearful he's going to be killed. His mother's fearful she's going to lose two sons. He's on the lamb. He's at the end of the day. He stops to sleep, and he has this remarkable dream. And we're not going to look at all the commentaries about what it means with this ladder, with the angels ascending and descending. But what I want us to remember is in that dream, God said, I am your God, 
I will watch over you. I will complete within you all the things I'm calling to you. And those are powerful, powerful promises that each and us can each of us can remember. But when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And here's the takeaway for us. God was with Jacob, even when he didn't realize it. And God is with us as well, even when we don't realize it. God didn't, or Jacob didn't realize it until after it had happened, and he looked back. And then he says, oh, God was there. I think this is the story of most of our lives as well. We're in the midst of things, and we look back and say, oh, God was there. And hindsight is 2020. But First Church, I don't want us to be a people that only sees God in our rearview mirror. I want us to recognize God's presence right then, because Jesus made the same promise to us. In Matthew 28, it says, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And then we know that the Holy Spirit came, and the presence of God reigns within us as believers in Jesus Christ. And we don't have to have the revelation of God being there afterwards. Because God is with us in the moments that are difficult. And God is with us when we experience loss. And God is with us when we miss the mark and go astray and not in a direction that God is calling us to. God is with us when someone else misses the mark and we're hurt because of someone else's actions. And God is with us when we are running. God is with us. And we are in the ninth day of the Christmas season. We're just a few days out from Advent when we were reminded that Jesus came, Jesus who is God, God incarnate as God, Emmanuel, God with us. And we have this advantage on Jacob because he didn't understand that, what that truly would mean, Emmanuel, God with us, that God would reign within each of us, bringing us comfort and joy and peace. And so First Church, I want us to be committed in this year. I want us to be committed to remembering that through the good times and the bad times, the hard times and the more than difficult times, that God is here. And I want us to remember that God is with us, empowering us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ for the world so that other people recognize the presence of God through our actions. And I want us to remember that this promise that God is with us to watch over us wherever we will go, and God will not leave us, and that God will be at home when we stop running, and God is with us when we're running and we feel alone. And it's my prayer that each of us would be different than Jacob, That at the end of the day, we would say that surely the Lord is in this place and I am aware of it. First Church, we're not alone. We have God and we have each other. And I want us this year to commit to reminding each other that we're not alone. Reminding those around us that maybe have never heard or maybe they've forgotten that they are not alone. Because I don't want us to have to look back only to be encouraged. I want us to look forward with a future and a hope because we know that surely God is in this place. Would you pray with me? Most powerful and present God, We thank you. We thank you for the presence that you are always here. In the times when our hearts are full of joy, we are thankful that you are here. And God, in the stillness of the night, when there's no one else around, 
and it's dark and we feel alone, Lord, remind us that you are here. And Lord, help us to be your hands and feet to remind those that are feeling alone that you are near. Lord, help us to be faithful people in serving you, reflecting your heart in this new year. It is a joy and an honor to serve you, Lord. We are humble to take your name and go forth into the world. We love you, Lord, and thank you. In your strong name we pray. Amen. We offer this time of prayer for you. And if you have a prayer need, you may come forward now. We'd be honored to pray with you. church may you be encouraged this week by the presence of god and may you encourage others that god is near as well you stand with me and let's go forward in this benediction this week lord of god lord god who is outside the boundaries of time we are thankful that you are near remind us of your presence lord and help us to reflect your heart in all that we do in your strong name we pray amen have a great week y'all love you happy new year